ground source geothermal, and I put them all together. So I'm kind of like an alliance builder or a um, consultant for those companies that help them get together and figure out how to work together. And one of the things that I learned uh, when I was studying Chinese and living in China, you know, people from different cultures have trouble talking to each other even when they speak the same language. <laughs> in fact, uh, my wife is a psychologist and she says that when people marry in their own hometown, they have a terrible time getting along because they think they live in the same culture, but they grew up in different families. <laughs> and of course, my wife is Chinese, so I never had that problem. I just I knew she was different. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, eco cities, how to design an eco city. It's a pretty complicated uh, thing, right? It's got a lot of stuff involved. But um, so this is a nice summary diagram. So it's got the you know the arrows going around in a circle to show that it's a dynamic process and, and things never stay the same. Right? Things always change. But you got to plan it in such a way that you know that it's going to change and, and figure out. Uh, you know pe people try to do things like if they do solar. I, have a, I worked with a guy who did, a, did solar. He spent thirty thousand dollars putting solar on his roof. He has a pretty big house. And then after it was all done, he decided to put meters on it and measure how much energy he saved. And, and in the process, he discovered that his swimming pool pump was broken and it was using half the energy that he was trying to save. <laughs> right. Um, so if you don't think holistically, you have trouble. And even if you do think holistically, you can't, you know everything. And, um, and one of the things that I like to tell the Chinese when they start telling me that they know it all, and then I just quote Confucius. He said, uh, which is, I, if I live to be very old and I study till I'm very old, and, and the last half is like a stitch in time, you know, the last half is still 90% I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, the Chinese are not the only ones. Confucius had a similar, I'm sorry, um, Plato talked about the analogy of the cave that we've been working in a cave all our lives and we don't know that the whole world is outside the cave. <laughs> and so uh, human condition is like that. Anyway, so network connection. All right, so anyway, that's the, that's the cycle. We want to try to cover all those things, but that's not really everything. Now, well, here's a, something that I, uh, the Chinese 12th five-year plan, which was passed last year, what it, um, the preface to the report from the Chinese Academy of Science is actually pretty enlightened. You know? Trend of globalization, marketing, urbanization, information, knowledge building is unstoppable. Science and technology is ever-changing, nurturing, new breakthroughs, capital, technology, knowledge, and talent are accelerating, accelerating paces for cross-border flows, Optimize allocations, the rapid rise of China, India, and other emerging developing countries. Global competitions are more fierce, international cooperation more extensive. So we believe that the future is innovation, development, characteristics, mode of change should be expressed by the words intelligent, green, low carbon, integrated, balanced, fairness, inclusiveness, cooperation, and safety. Wow. You love, gotta love that, right? <laughs> How come we don't have any, anybody in our government saying stuff like that, except Al Gore, right? <laughs> um, in fact, that is the future. Okay, but you know, a lot of us, a lot of us innovators are working on it anyway, right? And, and so things are happening in the U.S. Um, and even when the politicians are busy lying about what's happening, uh, we still manage to get some things done. And of course, it's hard because we all have, we have, you know, in the U.S. we have NIMBY problems because we're all kind of like bottom up and grassroots people have all the power. In China, actually, they have the same kind of problem. They have a top-down system so they can force certain things, but when it gets down to the grassroots, the government can't quite really control it. So 
it gets sabotaged just like, you know, subcontractor, subcontractor, always finds a way, right? So we have to just be aware of that, and that's part of what sustainability is all about. Okay, well, in China, there is a big need, and actually there's a need in the world, right? 400 million people moving into Chinese cities in the next 25 years, so that's like um, 8 million a year, no, 25 into 400. 60 million, right? 16 million. 16 million. So then, of course, World Business Council has, has uh, predicted there are going to be 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. So, you know, it's not that we couldn't live on the resources that our planet produces if we actually recycled them and put them back to work. But we can't, when we waste them all, or we build buildings on top of all the, all the farmland, and we uh, pollute all the water, and, and so on. It just can't be done. So we have to pay attention to do it. So the need is there, so that's the first step, or second step, all right, first, first step. The first step is commitment, teamwork, and vision. The second step is knowing, you know, what the problem is and going after it. Third step is to study science, nature, and apply the lessons. And you know, these are some things, back when, when I was a kid, we used to talk about Renaissance man and about thinking about you know, music, art, science, and of course, people like Howard know that innovation, I mean, jazz is a real good way of you know, getting people thinking about how to innovate. Uh, but music, art, science, they all go together. And so, but we, we don't actually often think about all of these things, the five kingdoms of nature and the five intelligences of humans. But those are all there, they're all necessary to make things work fully. There was an article in the paper today about they found this little tiny bird that infects a bumblebee and the plants, its seeds in the abdomen of the bumblebee and then that's what makes them, it's killing off the bee colonies. Or they think it is because it's more complicated than that, but they're finding them infested in certain places. And so, so we have to make allowances for all these different species to coexist and find ways to manage all that. Instead of trying to do away with one of them or just put pesticides on them and end up using the pesticides ourselves. So anyway, um, sustainability, eco cities is about integrating all of those things. Another way of looking at it is uh, that I like to think about. This is brain power over here. Organization, people, creativity, innovation, learning, applying it, and then there's the power. It can be manpower, horsepower, wind, wave, solar, biomass, crops, whatever. But they all need to go together into a system, into a process to make it, make it work most efficiently instead of fighting each other. Okay, well, the fourth, fourth step is to reach out to the stakeholders, and one of the things that a, a group I belong to, uh, we founded a group called the Children's Art and the Environment Project, and we went to China and we organized with the National Women's Federation and the um, China National Children's Center, we organized one million children to paint paintings about the environment, to just get their perspective on it, and of course, in the process, they tell their parents, and parents notice too. And so, kids are, are our stakeholders. So this is one pretty powerful 15-year-old showing what's happened to the trees. And I've explained what in Chinese, three trees is a forest, two trees is a woods, one tree is one tree. And then across the, the cross is not a Chinese character, but <laughs> we know what it means, right? And, and I learned, uh, actually, studying Harvey Cox, the cross was what the Romans used to kill Jesus, right? And they made it into the Christian symbol and put it on their shields when they went to war. And they made then Christianity the support for the Roman Empire, when actually the symbol used to be the fish, right? So they, uh, interesting, that cross. Okay, this is another child, a 14-year-old. 
notice what has happened to the farmland over the over the few years, the couple generations. This is one that noticed uh, the water is getting polluted and the air is getting hard to breathe. There are two kids, right? One of them is only six. Did that painting about the water, and uh, ten years old did the one on the where he draws masks. It's all in fashion these days, right? So. Now this is really getting the parent, getting the kids thinking about it, getting the uh, <coughs> schools doing projects about the environment, getting the parents aware. You know, so it is raising consciousness in all over the country. And then thinking about the future, what do they want? And, and you'll notice that this one is down in Guangxi, which is out in uh, southwest China near Vietnam, and this one is in Shanghai. So they have a slightly different vision of a green city, but you know. That's good. Right, the culture is in there. Actually, I spent a month in, in Yunnan province out near Guangxi last year, up in the mountains. And they have uh, you know, terraced agriculture. And they, and they have small farmer's fields that are like just uh, 100 feet square. And, and, and they have all these different crops growing together. So you see yellow, green. Uh, blue, all these different colors, and, and so they can do crop rotation and terracing so they get the water to use all the water properly. It's a pretty amazing place. And they have solar water heaters everywhere. Like almost every every building has a solar water heater on it. So they are pretty advanced even though you know they're not as modern as our culture. Okay, well, given all those different things that people um, differ over, you know, and part of it is I like this story of the blind man and the elephant as a way of explaining. They're all right, right? There's not one of them that's wrong. The only problem is when they say they're right and nobody, everybody else is wrong, right? And so what we need to do is just think about the problem in that way instead of making people wrong when they have a certain perception of things which kind of um, recognize well they see part of the picture and that's all part of uh, rebuilding an eco city because it's going to be like that that's <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah now as I mentioned to somebody earlier Michelle Bachman said last night that um, Benjamin Franklin and and uh, Abe Lincoln were both opposed to national health care <laughs> so that's why she's going to be making a crusade out of tearing down Obama. She quit today. Pardon? She quit today. Yes, yeah, she said that in her in her speech when she was quitting. Yeah. All right, but she said, "I'm not I'm not giving up the fight to, to you know obliterate Obamacare, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to run for president." <laughs> Oh, well, so just keep being negative and yeah. try to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is a um, you know a diagram of how a city might work in terms of how you organize it and what kinds of processes need to go on. And of course, it's oversimplified, but but it's done in such a way that you've got competition, you've got collaboration, they're balancing each other. You've got people-oriented environmental protection. They have to be balanced against each other, and energy conservation, resources saving, individual innovation, organizational process innovation, all those things need to go on at once. Uh, this was done by a Chinese uh, Xu Qiang in Shanghai Building and Science Research Center, and he thought, he said it was, well, in the center would be net, net is a harmonious uh, and sustainable development. I don't think it's always harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> But the net result is good if they can balance each other out. Right? And so people should be able to argue and disagree as long as they can respect truth that it might help. <laughs> or recognize that different people see different perspectives on things. Okay, so uh, develop shared perspectives. So that's the next step. And shared perspectives are, so looking at the built environment, I think of it as a set of tools. So it's not that I'm going to sacredly worship a building and say, oh, this is a historical monument, no matter what, even if it's ugly. Uh, but rather, think of it as a tool. And uh, 
the tool is going to accomplish a number of things. And some of those things are aesthetic. So I do want to preserve certain historical monuments and historical buildings. Uh, if they're, you know, have some some value to them in that way. <laughs> uh, we tried to re remodel our church that we built in 1906 as a old courthouse style. And the people, historical preservation people in San Francisco said, no, oh, it's a historical monument. You want to turn it into what? <coughs> we wanted to make it into a modern building. I mean, it was just built like an old courthouse to, you know, some college off ground and square building. And, uh, they didn't want us to change that. So we didn't, we built another floor on top. <laughs> but, oh well. So in green building standards are common frame of reference. Now standards are, as some of us know, standards have two faces. They're very useful in helping us to come to an agreement on what we're doing, and they also uh, encom encompass, encapsulate what we know at the time they were developed, but then things change. So they can prevent progress if, if people hang on to the standards too rigidly. So standards are a useful tool, but you need to kind of use them as a tool, not as a gospel. Okay, so uh, inclusive perspectives, energy, and resources are not simply fuel, right? They are tools. Uh, they're they're um, changing sources of life and whole ecosystems. So energy and energy and matter can be changed into each other. They can't be destroyed or created, but they can be changed into each other. So if we can keep that in mind and just, you know, use them creatively. So we need to use our tools to be creative. All right, now standards, talking about standards. So there are some really great standards from ISO, which is uh, International Standards Organization. And they, a lot of people say, wait a minute, we're Chinese, we're not gonna follow those international standards. Right. <laughs> Doesn't apply to us. But they, actually, when you look at them, a lot of them are just like a frame, framework. They say, well, you know, there's a process for deciding what's, what works and what doesn't and that the process is part of the standard, but what you actually decide depends on what you, you know, the truth, <laughs> what you discover, how things change. So it needs to be translated, it needs to be, so, you know, I guess some of us have worked, you work with an electrician, a plumber, you know, a glazier, um, a cement guy, and, and they, they have different words for some of the same things, right? So it's a little hard for them to talk to each other. So we need to kind of have some common language that we can talk to each other in, but be creative. So ISO 14000 is the environmental standards from the United Nations. Uh, and uh, they were, that was created in 1992 and uh, published, then the uh, 14001 and four were published in 96. Okay, that's an important year for my talk. Lead rating system, we know what lead is, right? Yep. So the lead 3.0, we're going to come back to that. Back, they decided in 2011, 10 or 11, that they had to measure the results. They used to say, well, you know, we should build a building this way because it's more sustainable, but then they never measured the results. Um, there was a professor at Stanford who got a student to do a study of the Jerry Dine building and he discovered that it wasted more energy than the rich coal buildings. <laughs> it was built to good principles, but they forgot how are people using the building? How are people using the building? Oh, Jerry Young, uh, environmental building at Stanford. Y2E2. Yeah, Y2E2. Oh, yeah. 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 So Yang is English, Yang is Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now it wasn't that it was built wrong, but it was built wrong for the use that it was put to afterwards. So when they had, they expected a certain amount of occupancy and they didn't have that many people there, so they were wasting energy. So things like that. But the thermostat wouldn't even go to the range that they needed. Right, they put the rock thermostat in there. So things like that, you, you anticipate to the best of your ability, 
But then you have to go back and measure and see what really is happening, otherwise... So we'll come back to uh, some of those issues. Okay, Cal Green was uh, passed last year. Now it's a state law that you have to build buildings that are sustainable and you have to measure it too. So we're making progress in California. Now the Chinese have a three-star three -star standard called MOHERD. MOHERD is the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development. So it's just an acronym. 2006, they had a national standard. Now, what we know about national standards, right, it's hard to get any past in the U.S. EPA is having a terrible time. In China, they can pass national standards, and they're good standards. But enforcement is difficult everywhere. And in China, one of the, you know, they have, back in the old imperial days, like in ancient Rome and ancient China, Transportation communications were really difficult. The only way you could even pay anybody is to say, you collect the taxes, you keep part of it, and send me the rest. Because there's no way you could get the, send it to the government and get the money back. <laughs> well, you know, when the, when, the, tra when the transportation communications are not well developed, you just can't do that kind of stuff. So, well, even in China, they have 55 different nationalities and they have different cultural uh, uh, perspectives and trying to communicate with people is not easy, even if they all learn Mandarin. Okay, well, anyway, you need to measure. So this is a measurement standard set up by, um, uh, it was presented by uh, Kirsten Miller at the Eco City Builders, which is in Oakland. Um, and they are doing, they're working with an international eco city standards organization. They're building a global standard for, for, for eco cities. And these are all the different things that need to be measured and tracked if you want the city to be ecologically sustainable. And uh, so these are the 15 dimensions on which you actually measure, according to their standard. Go back another second. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. Make sense? Can everybody read it? <coughs> no? Okay. So, pardon? Couldn't hear you. The white circle, the, all the, everything written within the circle? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I can read them fine. <laughs> okay, so access by proximity, air quality, biodiversity, carrying capacity, capacity, community capacity for people to participate. You know, one of the things they did in China uh, when the communists took over is they abolished their churches. So then people didn't have a place to go to meet each other. And so it broke up people and got, they got more isolated, like, like we are. I live in a condo. There's 44 families in my building, and I only know three of them. <laughs> right. We get together once a year for a Christmas party, that's it. Or when something goes wrong, we have, you know, we have a, a meeting to try to figure out what to do about it. Like when people break into the garage and <laughs> torture few cars and things like that. They stole all the tires off a car sitting in the parking lot last week. Right. Unbelievable. <laughs> oh well, um, energy, food, water, soil, natural resources, materials, culture, economy, education, and well-being. So those are the dimensions that we measure. Yes? Is there any agreed upon methodology for performing these measurements so they get repeatable results? Because this is over a whole nation how do these are hard things to measure they are so well the first step is to get the dimensions right identify the dimensions and then they have to uh, have some measurements so they have developed them yeah. and it's it's a global organization they've been having meetings and talking about okay how are you going to measure this so they have ways of measuring them they're not perfect they could be changing but yeah but you're right that needs more work whoops okay this is um, in 2008, right? The U.S. 
Green Building Council decided to measure the results of their buildings. And they discovered that, okay, so the orange ones have gold and platinum, black is silver, and, and green is certified. So zero is no improvement over the old buildings. We got some gold down and platinum down here. Right? And we got some green way up here. But that's only looking at energy savings, right? Yeah. That's what we're reading here. Right. So of course there's some other things. Yeah, right. But it's unintended well, but, results. But anyway, yeah, I mean they sh they should at least be able to save some energy, right? There's energy, there's water, and there's uh, you know quality of life, light, and all those things. But okay, so having done that, then that's why in 2011 they they said, okay, we will not certify it. We will not certify it as platinum unless it's been measured and it actually does what it's supposed to do. So, I don't believe they volunteered to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, after they got influenced by outside forces. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But, you know, that's the reputation. That's what they wanted to do. Yes. And, and getting people to do it, that's another story. Right? And, of course, the bottom line is, you know, if you if you get the building built or you get your whole community built up to a certain standard and you, and you measure it and you get a good result, that doesn't mean it's going to be good next year. <laughs> um, and so we're going to get into uh, buildings that teach. But people actually, when they when the building does it for them, then they waste energy. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then another another aspect is that having a computer model. So you might you might have a building you've measured it and you've said, okay, these are the variables, and we get it built within these specs, so it should be working, right? But you can't build it and then find out if it really is working. So you should build a computer model and see what you really predict. And if it didn't work out, then you find out what variable did I not include in my equation. Can be or get wrong. Pardon? Or get wrong. Or get wrong, right. <laughs> exactly. And of course, you know, with climate change, you can't really tell what the average temperature is going to be anymore. <laughs> right. But in that sense, it's good. Buildings Pardon? don't use energy. People use energy. Right. <laughs> Buildings don't use energy, people use energy. But our computer models are about the building. <laughs> <laughs> How do you build that into the computer model, right? <laughs> okay, well, then these are called key performance indicators. Those are the things that Howard was talking about. So there's a whole, you know, a bunch of organizations that have got together to develop these key performance indicators. So it's a way of like, okay, these are the things that we want to measure. We want to see if it actually does what we think it's going to do or what we built it to do. So this was done for the city of Tianjin. And <coughs> Kipo Lam is a friend of mine at Carnegie Mellon who helped build the, helped design the Tianjin Eco City project. Where can you find those? Um, well, you can do a search on KPIs. I mean, there's a there's an organization that, that uh, maintains a whole bunch of uh, models, but then you can you can use them for a while, and they pay them to use it more extensively, like that. So they have to make some money to improve the models. But uh, okay. This is a, a friend of mine, uh, Wei Ching Peng, at uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Went around. He was. He used to go around the U.S. and compare with China. He say, "Oh, P Americans are always criticizing the Chinese for being so wasteful." He said, "But our buildings use less energy than yours do." And so he then measured. You know, and in the U.S., he found out that well, there are all kinds of things going on. Like a building, they put what's called the. Um, uh, the hot air and the cold air system are actually fighting each other. So you take the, the hot air and you cool it off and then you heat up the cold air. And so you're wasting energy doing all that just because they didn't plan it right. They didn't think about all the whole system. But while he went around Beijing and he did some these comparisons. So there's 
five different kinds of buildings. So this is a five floors split unit. You notice that the air conditioners, this is a different room, it has a different air conditioner. <coughs> this one is 18 floors split unit, so every unit, they have a different air conditioner for the different rooms or heaters. This one is 26 floors split unit, they also split it. Then this one is 26 floors, uh, one air conditioner in each unit. And then central air conditioning. And central air is supposed to be the best, right? So what are we supposed to determine from that slide? Uh, this is the one. That this is, is the slide. Okay. okay, these are those five buildings compared. How much energy do they use? So actually, the more centralized the air conditioning, the more energy they use. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I still have that question. Yeah. Would you mind sure. the last time? What are we supposed to do? What would you have us take away from that photo, set of photographs? Okay, the photographs are it's hard to see, but on the ones on the left, they have a different air conditioning unit for each room in, in each apartment. You didn't go to China to figure that out. I mean, no, he's a Chinese uh, you know, professor. It's, okay. it's the next but, slide that, that so tells you the value. Of the but, well, but the thing is, in the US, it was the, the common belief system was that for air, central air conditioning is more efficient. Mm, which is wrong. Which was it's just wrong, right? And it's wrong in Beijing, it's wrong here too. What about the experience of living in one of these places? Do, do, do you get into that in your deliberations? Well, sure. I've lived in China. <clears throat> no, so, I, I don't, but, I'm not asking you. What is your experience? I mean, yeah. the, the experience is a general, as a general common. Yeah. The experience of, of living in one of those uh, uh -huh. into high-rise towers. Is that part of I wasn't able to read some of those old ones either. Yeah. Is, is okay. that uh, considered, in your view, a, a sustainable, green component the experience? What is the experience of a particular shelter configuration, character, blah, blah, blah? So you may okay. save energy with uh, the, the different units, but what about the quality of the living experience? Right. Okay. Are you more comfortable with central air conditioning, even though it takes more energy? But you know, or you spend all your time turning on and off the various units as you go from room to room in these other places. You know, so the quality yeah. of life issues. Okay. okay, so the quality of life actually that's one of the big issues in green buildings, is that if you if you try to set the temperature for some constant number, different people somebody's cold and somebody else is hot, right in the same room. So if you have a different air conditioner or heater in each room then the person in that room can set it to what they're comfortable with, and which they do. If you have a central control, then you either are you know, trying to find a way that, you know, one guy's turning up the thermostat and somebody else is turning it down. So, and nobody's comfortable. And always by 20 degree, degrees at a time. <laughs> right, because people yeah, are right. stupid. Yeah, there's only two temperatures, too hot and too cold. Oh, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. Absolutely. So that was one the thing that Jerry read out in the earlier slide. Buildings don't use energy, people use energy. <laughs> so bottom line is you can design your city, you can design your house or your work building beautifully, but it People are going to do what they do unless they get educated too. They get educated on how to use it. See, I would submit that yeah. nobody gave any thought, and I'm dying to see what your new Echo City is going to be like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> nobody gave any thought to what would the experience be like of living there in that. I notice mm -hmm. half of it is in the shadow. <laughs> The other half is stealing a little bit of sunshine. These are all buildings. He just went around to these buildings but and they, just to, to check them out. Right. All right, but the principle, yeah, I just right. want to see how that principle weaves through your 
Right. So that's a good point. Certainly, one of the principles of building in uh, or green building in Eco City is that you have maximum natural light exposure to all the windows that you can, so that people get more natural light than artificial. And so you you work with the shadows, you work with where the sun is. And this is one really interesting experience I had talking with the mayor. So I entertained 20 Chinese mayors uh, in October, and and. We talked to them about the eco cities, and we talked about what's going on in San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, and so on, and various projects. And one of the things they they came with the argument: Chinese buildings are more efficient than American buildings to begin with. So you know, don't tell us you know what to do. We don't. That, that was their first 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 yeah. argument, right? Then later on, I would say, well, the reason the Chinese buildings were more efficient is because of feng shui. And feng shui is actually it's, it began as a science of you know how how much sunlight do you get and you know how much shadows and all that stuff. So it's all kind of built into feng shui principles. So you never build a house facing north, right? And and certain it's all practical stuff. But they because they're communists, they consider that superstition, right? So we oh, feng shui, is feng shui, right? So it's kind of a paradox, because they knew that their old buildings were more efficient than ours, but then they, <laughs> the reason, right, because, called that superstition. Because they were associating feng shui with, with, with where mirrors are on the wall instead of, instead of with the way the air moves through the building and the way the building faces the sun. And okay, the reason it. is because it has become like a superstition, like all, all things tend to do. So um, there was a tour guide that took me through um, a park in, in Suzhou last year, and he said, okay, do you know why the bridges that go across the lake are crooked? They don't go straight across the lake, they go this way, that way, that way. Right. So his, his first answer is, well, because the evil spirits always go in straight lines, so they won't follow you. <laughs> All right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, when you think about that, people who are monomaniacal about trying to get to the other side, they, they miss all the scenery and everything. So in a way, right, the evil spirits would be getting them right, yeah. from their own head. <laughs> but <laughs> then he went on to explain there's two other reasons. Right? And one is so that you, uh, you take more time out in nature and that you get to see nature from different perspectives. It's a park after all. Okay, well, there's that. Okay, so anyway, this is just about energy efficiency. Then there, there's the, you know, the comfort and, the, and all that. But I think you've made the point that central air conditioning being more efficient is a superstition. Ah, right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, anyway, the Green Building Council has uh, measured and, and pointed out that if done right, Green buildings will save you 24 to 50% of energy, 33 to 39% of CO2 emissions, 40% of water, and 70% on solid waste. So if you do it right, you get all those savings. And then there's the other aspects, the quality of life things, right? It's natural light and, and fresh air and you know buildings that don't have windows that open, don't get you fresh air, and things like that. But anyway, this is, these are good things, right? Then you also have to look at, okay, if you, green, if you build a green building and you build it, I mean, a solar panel, how, how dirty is it to make the solar panel? How much pollution is caused, right? And if you use Portland cement, how much cement, how much pollution do you make in making the cement? And so on. So you need to think about the whole cycle of, of it. Uh, okay, so this is a point about Buildings that teach, there's a whole school of thought about it. The building itself should teach you why it's saving energy, why it's making your life more comfortable. It should remind you while it's doing that, so you don't take it for granted if you don't miss the point. It should do it in an artistic way. It shouldn't do it and have a sign there and say, you know, this building is saving so many kilowatts a day because, you know, but it should 
to remind you to leave the light, turn the lights off when you leave the room, and, and why that it's more comfortable in there when uh, because the building's taking care of this or that. But if you override it, you won't be more comfortable. Yeah, this this is a trend in the industry in general that uh, people want to build buildings where the occupants don't see all the guts and they don't. This all happens by magic. But right. <laughs> now uh, you, you, you don't get the uh, occupant participant right participation yeah. unless we design buildings yeah. in order to emphasize the results of their actions, and then you actually can. Um, and the thing about influence people about so doing that, you know, um, you know. Go back to what makes people happy. <coughs> a lot of people, you know, haven't studied that or haven't paid attention to it. But where does happiness really come from? And 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 you know, Aristotle did a big study of that back a long time ago, 600 years before Christ. He said, well, happiness comes from doing something well and from doing it repeatedly or doing something different but well every day and to doing it in a socially responsible way because you feel like you're a part of the community and you're doing that you're that you're a responsible member and that makes you feel good and if you do it not one just one day but do it for your whole life then you're happy for your whole life and and that actually bears I mean all the all the major religions have said similar things and they've all become superstition and people say it over and over but they don't really quite get it. So um, anyway, we want to be happy. So if we know that we're saving water and we're saving energy and we know why, because our children get to drink clean water and we're not wasting it and because know that it's good for the community, our neighbors are happier, that we're participating together, then we have then we're living a happier life. If we're not aware of it, the building's doing it for us, then we can, you know, get drunk and think we're happy. Right. Okay, so you can recycle different resources. So these are various things that you can make in out of carbon. You know, people are talking about, well the best way thing to do with carbon from coal fire power plants is to capture it and bury it under the ground, right? <laughs> but carbon actually is a very valuable resource. Yeah, some of it's expensive. Biochar is not expensive. But, uh, you know, nanotubes and all that, well, they're expensive. What but is biochar? Biochar is a charcoal made uh, that will, has the pores of a certain size so that it will hold phosphorus and nitrogen and all the nutrients that the plants need inside the pores and but the pores are not so big that water can wash them out. So when you spread it on a farmer's field it captures those nutrients and holds them until the plants need them. Plants can reach their dendrites into those pores and get it when they need it. So it actually makes the field more fertile for a longer period of time and it doesn't all those things don't wash into the water table where they become poison. So if you spread that on the farmer's fields, if it needs it, right, then it can hold the nutrients and the water can still pass through. Because if it doesn't go through the pores, it doesn't wash out the nutrients. Is that a common product or is that kind of new for the industry? Um, well, I've known about it for 10, 15 years. It was discovered in the Amazon forest when they discovered that there were some forest fires and somehow it was always very fertile there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, but um, when people can make charcoal out of it, it just it has to be like 700 some degrees, right in that temperature range, then the pores come out that size. And then they can store the phosphorus and things in there. So that's a new industry for, you know, we could new product you can sell. So if, you, if you're making, you know, biomass to energy and you've got leftover charcoal, then another product to sell. Right. You have to develop the market, though, make the help farmers aware. Could you use that in aquaponics for the biochar? Say again? Yeah. Could you use the solar in aquaponics? Yeah, sure. Yeah, for the solar. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is Suzhou. Uh, this is one old city. Now, remember when uh, ISO 14000 was passed? Uh, 
the United Nations has started saying we should take care of the environment. Let's pass, let's give people some guidelines. 1992, 1994. So 1994, um, China and Singapore got together and decided to build an eco city. And they followed those principles that the United Nations had set out to build that city. And Suzhou is in China, Bai Lake Thai is just west of Shanghai. So that's why I put the sign there to say Shanghai is that way. <laughs> um, so I was there last year for, for a month or so. And, and uh, this is what's happened to that city since 1994. This is just the first, first uh, to uh, 2003, this chart. But, so uh, total investment was <coughs> up to 3,315 3, million. Right? Gross domestic product for that city has gone up to 510. Thirty-six five ten. Yeah, thirty-six five ten million. Right. And uh, workers, number of workers has gone up to like seventy-nine thousand. Total government income from taxes has gone up to almost um, what's that? Five thousand million. Five billion. <laughs> and. Companies had more money in the bank, and people had more money in the bank. That'll be over the years. And farmers' incomes went up. So those, yeah. like, farmers near the city, or what do you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an eco-city, so it's kind of integrated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon? 1994. 1994, when they first built it, to 2003. <coughs> How does that track against other economic metrics such as inflation in the area for comparative, for comparative city? Because it could be that every city would show a similar model given some other out external economic events. So what, what's the yeah. normalized, yeah, normalized yeah. data? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, I think that's normalized. But I think you can have a look at it. I mean, definitely, the income levels are higher <laughs> there than they are in the rest of China. Actually, it's an Hebrew. Everything's in decline. Say again? It's an Hebrew. Everything's in decline. Oh, right. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so this is uh, in text, right? So annual revenue increased from 30 million to 10 billion. Gross <coughs> national product or regional product, 100 billion per year. 100 times increase. Okay, tax revenues went up. Foreign funds. From 16, 16 billion, and then registered capital that's left, right, went up 130 billion now, and 500,000 jobs were created. So that's a pretty successful. Now, one of the things about that that made it so successful is the <laughs> international joint venture. See, if it had been simply a domestic project, politics would have killed it. People have been fighting, and then they wouldn't have achieved all of it. But, but it was an international joint venture. Why did that help? Because one, the local government can't decide it by itself. You're saying it's just a common trend in China, or maybe everywhere. That everywhere. If you have, I mean, if you have some other outside parties that have an interest <laughs> in the success of the thing, then you have fewer cheaters who try to undermine things locally. Because because the money is coming in from outside, or well, it was a joint venture, so they had power, too. So it's like so a corruption was to lie to yourself, but try lying to you lying in the marriage program. Yeah. That's a point. Yeah. It's a yes. yeah. yeah, I didn't put any pictures in here, but it's a very beautiful city, and they have, uh, uh, you know, gardens and public transit and they have a lake and fishing, and it's very pleasant. Yes, the weather is going because because I mean just think about it. It's a, it's an eco city. It's built around the convergence of all these different interests.
and, and uh, so they need to be sustainable locally. They're not dependent on just a foreign market. So they want they do things in the full cycle as much as they can, and so it becomes uh, it, you know. So they have the good years and the bad years because of the agriculture or whatever. But then they have a the whole system is integrated, so they're able to kind of balance it out a bit. And that's why they're able to show a continuous increase over all the years. They're less dependent on external. Right. Less dependent on external stuff. Sorry. Okay, so so now these numbers uh, actually went beyond 2003. So they went up to like uh, 2009. So was okay. It that, was it that same curve? Yeah, well, I mean, you saw the numbers. It's kind of either ha I don't have a chart of the of the longer period, but it, I could have drawn one with those numbers. But it was consistent. Yeah, right. It was consistent. Yeah. How many people live in the city? Um, it, it said it was. It said a half a million. <coughs> <coughs> it created half a million jobs. Half a million yeah, jobs. It's it's average local working income salary. The prior slide. Prior one said, "Our the charge." They created a half million jobs. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the exact population of it, but it's yeah. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is in China they've been lately building cities at an incredibly accelerated rate. So right. look at a place like Shenzhen yeah. and how quickly it's grown. I'm just wondering. Can you grow an eco city as fast as you could grow a non eco city, mm. for example? Right. Well, when you build an eco city, it's going to take longer for planning and it's going to take longer for coordinating because they've got to get all those things together. But then uh, you get a more steady growth because you're taking into account <coughs> all the side effects of what you're doing. So, Shenzhen. They built a bunch of fast factories there, so things bounded leaps and bounds. But then they had impacts on other things. Well, the last time I was there, they had huge, uh, these beautiful, huge condo complexes that nobody could afford to buy, so they were empty. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, by so, definition, yeah, yeah, how, I think I would use the, the, the phrase uh, "how fast they grow." I would think, by definition, of what is really sustainable. The rate of growth is a whole different conversation. <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have a population limit? On, uh, we're in China in this deal, right? So we're talking yeah. one child per family. Yeah, I mean, they have a they have a rule about one child per family. Right. Uh, so, but it's so but it's. it's they don't, they, don't avoid, they don't enforce it as well as. It depends on where you are, you know, if you're a farmer on the Boonies, then you might need two children to help out farming. Yeah. So, so, so the, yeah. the, uh, online uh, says that it will have 350,000 residents by 2020. Okay. Uh, this is according to Climate Wire. What will? Thank you, thank you, city. The, the eco the Tangjiang eco city. I don't know if I'm saying it right. But is that the Tianjin? Oh, Tianjin. Tianjin. So oh, okay, okay. okay. So the next one. That's oh, okay. the next one. That's oh, okay. the different one. Oh, yeah. Right. It's not the same. Okay, this is Tianjin. So based on, I mean, there were still, you know, political controversies, and, and eventually Singapore said, okay, we're not in the Suzhou project anymore. We got out of it. We were put into it, and so it's now it's yours. But then they formed a new joint venture to do Tianjin. So Tianjin is about like uh, five or six years old. I mean, Tianjin is a very old city, but they have uh, Tianjin Binhai, which is like uh, over overlooking the seacoast uh, eco development zone, and they they plan that out uh, to be sustainable. And they've got um, when you go there, they'll take you to the to show you all the models that they built of what the city's going to look like, and and so you can actually see the models and. They, all of the things are planned according to that, but they, they're, they're having, even though it's an international joint venture, it's going much lower than they intended. And the pollution levels are not as good as they had planned. So there's, uh, 
you know, managing people is like herding cats. You, know, you can't always manage everybody. And, but they're making some good progress in Tianjin also. And, and there are a lot of international uh, companies involved in Tianjin. So it, it's a much bigger project than, than Suzhou. Yes? Is it is? You know, there's an innovation curve. You know, there's the there's the early adopters and then the late adopters, and at some point it reaches a um, a curve. So it's just early people. Some people will start will be reluctant, and then, but they'll try. I mean, they're very daring people. Will just try. And like me, I'm born in the year of the dragon, and also an Aries, and I just I just love to try new stuff. <laughs> And other people, they just never try something till it's. Um, well, money is what I'm talking about. Part, money is part of it. Billions in coal. Right, right. You know, this is something yeah. that moves interest in other business. Yeah. Right. But, but it's self selecting. If you, it's not in your business interest, you don't do it. And you go find the people that think it is in their best business interest. So maybe right. centralized government makes that a little easier, kind of bypasses those problems. And just yeah, so, to some degree, I mean, they have passed regulations and they're forcing some of the coal companies to be cleaner and, you know, they're shutting down some polluting factories and, uh, but it's like pulling teeth to some, you know, like in uh, Dalian, which is on the peninsula opposite Korea, they have a big plastics factory that's been polluting like crazy and the whole rest of the city are, are up in arms and they shut the thing down and then the local government reopened it because it's $800 million a year coming into their coffers. <laughs> so, but I'm working with the developer who's trying to make that into an eco city. So it's got, you know, and they're arguing about whether the sea level is going to rise five meters or two meters and trying to figure out that, that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> and what to plan for. But, um, so is there in the plan? Yeah. Is there like a hard edge around the city, even if it's on paper and they're not mm -hmm. going to get there for 30 years? It, conceptually, is there a hard edge yeah. or is it open-ended for growth and growth movement toward right, a, right. A, a neighboring city in Um We'll look at that in a minute. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, good. okay, so this is Tianjin. That's another example of a city that's been in development for a long time. Uh, and this is a plan for, for Tianjin, so keep a lamp through this. So, that, and so treated wastewater, agriculture, combustible waste, biogas, food waste, recyclables, everything cycles around. That's a plan. And then I put, well, what else is needed here? They're not talking about people, right? It's all about <laughs> So the people piece needs to be there. All right, um, as, as a part of our team, now this, uh, this developer who, who's doing the plan for, for um, Nansha is uh, Heller Mann, that's out of San Francisco, and they've done, uh, they're doing 10 different projects.